Okrima Media's Polity, this is Sane Jaminim, joining me today to unpack issues related to South Africa's energy crisis is the Democratic Alliance leader, John Steenhazen. So, uh, John, we speak to you while the country is faced with serious uh, power cuts that are crippling our economy even further. What do you think are the main causes of uh, our issues uh, with, in terms of electricity crisis and how can it be solved? Well, I think that you've got to locate the problem uh, at its source. And the source is very poor policy decisions that have been made by the ANC. A cater deployment, uh, which has hollowed out Eskim over the course of the last decades, displacing uh, qualified engineers and technical personnel with deployed caters who uh, have run the institution into the ground. Rampant corruption, and you've seen that around the Medupi and Kusile uh, uh, new builds, as well as the price gouging that you're seeing on uh, the coal mafia that are operating uh, extensive coal supplies to Eskom at massively inflated prices, and obviously this is a huge, um, a huge problem. And so you've got to locate the 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 problem where it is. Added to that is the ideological disconnect that we have in the country, where we have a government and a governing party that is clinging uh, desperately to a model that the rest of the world has moved away from, and that is state-owned monopolies. And that has left us at the mercy of a single electricity generator, distributor, and supplier. And you've decided to take ESCOM to court uh, to oppose the recent electricity uh, tariff hikes. How do you respond to the argument that a key reason for ESCOM's unsustainable debt is that uh, NASA has been setting electricity prices uh, below cost for a number of years? Well, I would reject that. Um, and I would say to you that there are a number of areas where Eskim should be looking at to uh, put itself in a better financial uh, situation. First, Eskim is 66% overstaffed. And that 66% is largely made up of people who are not core engineers, who are not core to the Eskim key business. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Eskim has been a site of major corruption where there's huge price gouging on all procurement because there are mafia networks that are running, uh, that have been put there through cater deployment, which is why Eskim sometimes pays up to 2,000 rand for something simple as a household broom, and why we're paying a huge premium for substandard coal. Um, thirdly, uh, Eskim needs to cut its cloth accordingly, and it has spent money on bonuses and salaries for overinflated officials rather than on directing those funds towards new builds and maintenance uh, of the uh, of the infrastructure a lot of people have been complaining uh, that many da run municipalities uh, reportedly charge the highest markup on the electricity that they buy from escom how do you explain that any uh, energy supplier has got a cost of doing business and given the fact that load shedding has caused so much damage to municipal infrastructure, particularly, we've seen substations that blow up when the electricity is put back on and there are power surges. We've seen the huge theft of that infrastructure, municipal infrastructure, when load shedding is taking place, where it provides a perfect time for cable thieves and copper thieves to steal municipal infrastructure. Municipalities obviously have to be able to recoup some of those costs, but then also to be able to put money aside to fund uh, future building. But what I would say is that there are municipalities around the country that abuse the situation and turn the electricity uh, sector in, and electricity provision into a profit center for themselves so they can then take that money and spend it on tracksuits for councillors to attend Selga games on non-core essential things. So our view is that when you have that money coming in from the electricity tariff, it should be ring-fenced and used for the expansion and maintenance of your infrastructure network and not as a revenue source for your municipality to spend on non-core activity. And now there is a wide uh, debate that is taking place uh, in the country about whether to move ESCOM uh, to another department. What is your take on, on the ANC suggestion of moving ESCOM now to Energy and Mineral Resources Department? So I think that um, it's always been the DA's position that we shouldn't have a Department of Public Enterprises and that those uh, monopolies shouldn't exist. But if they are going to exist, they should be located in the line department where they are naturally located. So Transnet should be in the transport department. 
um, and, and the like. However, in this particular instance, the problem is not so much the move. The problem is around the person who's in, who it's been moved under. And that's Mr. Gwede Mantashe, the Minister of Minerals and Energy, because he has been the single biggest obstacle to renewable um, expansion in South Africa and the single biggest ideological obstacle to us being able to transition to alternative forms of energy in the country. And our viewpoint is that while the move itself to energy would probably make some sense, the fact is that you're putting the fox in charge of the hen house and it's going to yield terrible results and you're going to have an ideological blockade now of us being able to get out of the situation uh, and getting to the soonest possible date that we can say goodbye to load shedding and have energy efficiency and confidence in South Africa. And without a doubt, uh, load shedding has affected a number of sectors. But now you've recently welcomed uh, discussions between Minister Togo Tidiza and the agricultural sector. But tell us why you are concerned that there is no tangible plan to shield farmers from load shedding and maintain food security. Yeah, well, this is a huge problem. And, and this is the thing. Government has spoken a great deal but very little action. And when we've seen plans, like we saw the president's emergency plan last year that was tabled, that was ostensibly going to deal with the load shedding crisis, very little of that's been implemented. So the government's very good at talking. It's not very good at doing. And this is having a devastating impact. And um, you know, the agricultural sector is a very good example. It's going to be massive crop failure because farmers cannot irrigate their crops. Over uh, millions of chickens were had to be destroyed and set aside because of the failure of electricity in the country. And it really affects every business, but it is going to impact now on food security. It's going to have a massive impact on unemployment as well, where we're going to see more and more companies closing, unable to keep their doors open, and are going to be letting go of employees. And in a country with a 42% unemployment rate, uh, that really spells disaster. So I've recently joined a discussion where a lot of South Africans were saying that uh, the impact of load shedding is almost similar to what we've seen uh, with the COVID-19, especially in terms of job losses. What is your take on that? I think load shedding and the crisis at Eskom is the single biggest crisis facing South Africa's growth and jobs agenda. Uh, it is the single biggest inhibiting factor to us being able to encourage entrepreneurship and new business development, but also to retain existing uh, investment. If we want to get South Africans employed, we need to attract large-scale, um, load-skilled manufacturing jobs to South Africa. That means factories. That means industrial operations. Now, no factory or industrial operation can operate uh, sustainably when they're sitting with up to eight to 10 hours a day without electricity. And so not only are we harming current employment and current uh, factory output, we are deterring potential investors who are looking to move their manufacturing operations to emerging market economies. And they look at South Africa as part of a basket of emerging economies. And we immediately red flag because of the electricity crisis, which other emerging economies have dealt with a long time ago. So it's a massive um, suppression of existing economic growth and a massive deterrent to future economic growth. Now, the DA is planning a march um, on the NC at headquarters on the 25th. Why are you marching to Lutuli House and not uh, to the seat of government uh, at the union buildings? Because uh, Lutuli House is the scene of the crime, and we've seen through state capture and uh, the revel revelations out of the Zondo Commission that the ANC has centralized the powers and functions of the state at Latuli House, mm -hmm. which is why we sat with the corruption around Kusile and Madupi involving Chancellor House emanating from Latuli House. The CADA deployment that saw incompetent individuals and politically connected individuals and the mafia networks being infiltrated into Eskom, those decisions were made at Latuli House. The ideological decisions around clinging to a state-owned monopoly are made at Latuli House. We don't have an Eskom problem in South Africa. We've got an ANC problem. They are the government. They are directly the reason that we're sitting with the load shedding crisis through their acts of omission and commission over the course of the last two decades. And as I said to somebody earlier, if you've got a sore tooth, you go to the dentist. Uh, you don't uh, go to see your plumber. So we've got to locate the problem at the source. 
And if we're going to deal with the problem, we've got to understand what that source is. And we're going to focus attention on dealing with that source and compelling them. And the only language that the ANC understands, and that is electoral consequence and legal consequence. And that's why we've said the time for talking is over. The time for listening to the president promising us, like he did in 2015, that in 18 months' time, we'd forget load shedding ever existed. The now time is to take action. It's no use us begging government to do the basic uh, job it should be doing anymore. We've got to now compel them to do so. And that's why we're marching and we're going to be taking legal action. So we're dealing with a political consequence and a legal consequence for the situation that South Africa finds itself in at this particular moment. Talking about the polls, I know the country is going to the polls next year. Is your party kickstarting your election campaign with your anti-load shedding march at Tulutuli House? No, we kickstarted our campaign last year already. Okay. Um, we're preparing. We've been preparing uh, for this election. It's going to be the most important election, I think, in uh, our post-democratic South Africa. And I think mm-hmm. South African citizens must understand that this may be the last chance they have to use democracy to solve the problems that the country has. And that's why we started last year already with our election campaign. We'll be rolling it out during the course of this year. And this is just the start. I mean, we, we've got a long campaign ahead of us, and we're going to make the case to South Africans that we've got a government that cannot even keep the lights on. It's time to, uh, as they've cut our power, it's time to now cut their power. It sounds like you don't have hope. Uh, our president... Uh didn't even go to Davos because of this crisis. Are you not expecting any positive outcome? The only reason the president cancelled his trip to Davos is that he was going to be horribly embarrassed because the last time he was in Davos, and I've seen the video footage, he was waxing lyrical about how he had solved the electricity problem and that load shedding was a thing of the past and that South Africa had built a sustainable and secure energy sector in the country. And I think it was going to be very awkward for him there to explain that. So I think that's why the president didn't go to Davos. But nevertheless, he sent Mr. Gondongwana there, who made the same empty promises that the president made in 2015, that in a few months' time, we'll forget that load shedding ever happened. The reality is, I've seen the timeline. Government's own plan has us with rolling blackouts all the way through into the post-24 year. And that's on government's best case scenario that they have. So it's very clear the government has lost the spin on the ball. They've lost the initiative. They've run out of ideas. Uh, They're clinging to a failed ideology. And the only way for us to get this problem solved is to get them out of the way so that we can start to fix the problem and get energy and electricity back into our homes and back into our economy. And lastly, let's hear now your strategic approach uh, to coalition governments if the ANC achieves uh, less than 50% of the votes uh, in next year's election. And tell us which parties uh, will you partner with to remove the ANC and which parties are you not willing to work with? Yes, so um, we believe that the ANC will lose the majority in the next election. I think there's two worst-case scenarios. One, the ANC retains its majority with a slimmer margin, and that means they'll start becoming more radical, or that they drop below 50% and there's a tie-up between the RET faction and the ANC and the economic freedom fighters. Both of those, we believe, from a policy, a governance perspective, and a socioeconomic perspective would be a disaster for the country. So working back from those two scenarios, which we call the nightmare scenarios, we need to come up with the next least worst option for South Africa. Who are we prepared to work with? Well, any party that shares the values and principles of the DA, and particularly the core four key values and principles, non-racialism, respect for the rule of law and the economy and the constitution, a social market economy that treats business and the private sector as a partner in the jobs and growth agenda, and a capable state free of cater deployment and corruption that is able to deliver to the people of South Africa. Any party that commits to those four key values and principles, we would be prepared to talk to. Um, And that will be our approach going into the election, was our approach going into the last, uh, the uh, post-local government election. And and that principled approach, I think, will guide us going forward. We have to save South Africa. Um, No one's coming to save us. We've got to do it ourselves. And the only way we're going to do it properly is by making sure we... Uh, do it through the ballot box. I hope as many South Africans from across the spectrum uh, join us. And if you don't want to come to the march, that's fine. But for goodness sake, do something 
in your community, in your area, in your sphere of influence, to show your displeasure. The only language the ANC understands is when there's electoral consequences. That's the only reason they removed Jacob Zuma when South Africans took to the streets to uh, stop Zuma. Um, it's the only language they understand, and we really hope there's going to be rolling mass action in response to the rolling mass blackouts that we're facing around the country. That was the DA leader, John Steenhuizen, in conversation with Polity to discuss energy crisis in South Africa.